I don't drink Monster Energy, and I don't own a pair of three-quarter length camo shorts. However, I do like a good classic 4x4. So the question I'm asking today, is this Toyota Land Cruiser a worthwhile purchase in 2023? Let's find out. Hello everyone and welcome to my rendezvous with an automotive legend, the 1999 Toyota Land Cruiser Colorado and it's the VX edition, which had a few more bits as extras. It's a SUV that's not only defied time, but it's embraced it and aged quite like a fine whiskey. The beating heart of this Toyota Colorado VX is its 3.4 litre V6, the 5VZ-FE. It had around 190 horsepower and 220 foot-pounds of torque. While you've got a lot of pulling power, it's not exactly sports car overtaking capacity, is it? Being a Toyota, the engine is obviously really reliable. There are a couple things to look out for if you're buying one. This engine is timed via a belt instead of a chain, so you want to look to see when that's last been done. One benefit of this engine is its non-interference. So if your timing belt goes, you're not gonna have your valve slapping into your piston and it's not gonna destroy your whole engine, but obviously you still wanna make sure you've got it done. If you're buying this car, and this is more for cars sort of near the sort of 200,000 mile mark, you wanna see if their head casket has been done or if there's any evidence that it's starting to go. So look at the smoke coming out of the back, things like that. These engines are really prone to oil leaking and I had it with this one. The rocker cover gasket leaks a lot and if you look around the sump, you can often find a lot of seepage around there. I really like a V6, but I have to be honest, I think this car would have been perfect with a V8. Just the sound of a V8, the size of the car, its road presence, it just would have been all the boxes ticked. That's one little thing I wish I had. Toyota claims that you can get in the high 20s with your consumption. However, when I'm driving it, I don't really see above 22. It's quite a thirsty engine, especially if you're pulling loads. Power is delivered from the engine via a four-speed automatic gearbox. It's quite responsive and it seems to know what you're telling it to do and it doesn't really get lost when you're kicking down or anything like that. Oh, sh what the f ah. This car, as I was alluding to, comes with four-wheel drive and you can actually engage it yourself. You've got a little, what looks like a manual gear change knob down here, which you can use to switch into four-wheel drive mode. You've got a high range and a low range, as well as a locking diff. So really, if you're going proper off-road, you've got all the tools that you'll need to do that successfully. The ride is really nice. And for a 4x4, it's much better than I expected. When it's empty, it's very stiffly sprung. So it's easy for it to sort of dance and skate about and feel a bit like you're driving on stilts. Um, when you put a few things in the car, it seems to settle much nicer and is much nicer to drive. For a Toyota, the interior is actually quite luxurious. There's a, quite a liberal dash of leather used all around in this vehicle. You've got heated seats, you've got CD players, dual zone climate control, heated and adjustable electric wing mirrors, which are really useful. I will say as well, although it's got a good AC system with loads of options, it does feel like one of those horrible icky children coughing on you like that. <coughs> it's not very powerful. You've got a little small analog clip. You've got a little small analog clock here, which is a nice touch. The buttons are well laid out and it's quite easy to do things without looking at them. And it's quite an intuitive interior. Everything is where you'd expect it to be. Your seating position in this car is very high. And like cars of the 90s, you've got very thin A, B and C pillars. I think in this car, would you argue it's A, B, C and D? You've got D pillars, you've got four. Anyway, they're quite thin, you've got great visibility. Looking out over the bonnet, you can see where it stops and looking rearwards, you get a really good idea of where the back is in comparison to the space around you. You even get a small computer, a trip computer here with many different modes. You've got a clinometer, so it can tell you how much you're pitching, how much you're rolling, how much you're going back and forth. You've got a compass, which I guess is useful sometimes. And you've got a little computer which you can tell height differences, elevation changes, how high you've gone up, how high you've gone down, things like that that might be useful to an avid off-roader. 
One little nice touch on this car that I quite like is the aerial that you can put up manually. Seems pretty stupid, but I quite like doing that myself. You've got a large sideways opening boot, which is great for just lobbing anything you can throw into this vehicle. The seats come up, you've got seven seats, so if you've got lots of friends, and you can still fit luggage in, even when you've got seven seats. The exterior is really nice, and it's aged well for something from 1999. Cars of that day seem to use a lot of square and boxy lines, whereas this uses a lot more curves than the average car of the era. You've got a large metal platform step on either side to aid entry into the vehicle, and you've got a built-in roof rack, which is quite useful. I really believe with this car, you could go on an 800 mile round trip, but at the end of the trip, you could go on a, a fully badass off-road trek and the car would just take it in its stride. I've tried some of the newer Land Cruisers and while they do have a few more comforts on the interior and everything, I feel like they're a bit more underpowered compared to this. And really, if I was using it for anything apart from driving about, I would take the older one over that. Who's to say you couldn't use this for literally any purpose in the everyday life? Maybe not for parking in London. That's the only thing I might not suggest. Can't tell, is it warm? Oh, there's a red light. Whether it's a good buy in 2023 comes down to money, I think. Objectively, it's a great car. It's got loads of space, lots of pulling power. It's comfortable and you've got loads of creature comforts. However, it's not ULES compliant and I'm sure it's going to be taxed even more in the future when they start clamping down on emissions and all that rubbish. If you've got money to chuck at the car, I think it's a great buy. The reliability of the engine and the sort of smaller cost you have to spend on maintenance kind of offsets the extra cost that you get with ULEs and environmental charges and petrol and running it. So really, I think, in my opinion, I think this is a great buy in 2023, just as long as you've got a bit of money to throw at it. So there you have it. There's my review of the Toyota Land Cruiser Colorado VX. I really like this car and I'm starting to use it a lot more recently, which shows how much I like it. I don't want to tell you to like and subscribe. That's a bit weird, isn't it? But if you do, we appreciate you. Go back up. So thank you for staying with me and enduring this absolutely terrible review where I demonstrate I know absolutely nothing about cars. However, I hope you've enjoyed seeing this Land Cruiser. Oh, for fuck's sake, into gear. Okay.